<clears throat> All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, this afternoon, we're actually going to be treated to um, a wonderful overview of Book of Mormon history by, uh, by Jack Welch and Kirk Magleby. Uh, and even though the order of our presentations is somewhat backwards, I'm essentially going to pick up where they will leave off. Uh, they're going to bring us up to the present as far as the, uh, the history of Book of Mormon research, and I'm going to be projecting a bit into the future uh, in so much as possible. It's admittedly a, a difficult task to try to predict what will be happening in Book of Mormon studies in years to come. Uh, I thought maybe the most reasonable way of approaching this would be to uh, approach um, scholars who are actively involved in Book of Mormon research um, that are committed to doing good scholarship and who I anticipate will continue to be publishing into the future. Uh, most of what I have to say here today was really based on uh, input that I received from the likes of Robert Millett, uh, Thomas Wayman, Sean Hopkin, Bill Hamblin, Kerry Hull, Brian Hoglid, uh, Brant Gardner, Nick Frederick, Joe Spencer, John Hilton III, and Amy Easton Flake. Some of those names you know, uh, some of those you probably don't. Those you don't, you will probably will in coming years. Uh, they are doing exciting work. Um, now, despite their extremely diverse academic backgrounds, some of them do 19th century literature, others focus on theology, um, some do ancient Near Eastern studies, I found that there actually was a great deal of overlap in uh, what they, where they hope to see the field go into the future. Uh, the one hope that they all shared was that we can actually move the Book of Mormon scholarship in, more into mainstream academia. There have been some exciting developments in recent years in uh, Mormon studies in general. Uh, such as the establishment of Mormon Studies program at such prestigious institutions as Claremont or uh, most recently the University of Virginia. But the academic study of the Book of Mormon itself oftentimes is not part of those programs. Uh, Mormon Studies in general is dominated by church history. Very little attention is paid to the actual scriptures. One exception, of course, is the Book of Mormon of, as literature class. It's being uh, taught by uh, David Bakaboy at the University of Utah. Uh, it's the first of its kind. It's actually garnered some national attention. Um, it's been uh, written about or uh, talked about on everything from, the, from Fox News to the Huffington Post and everything in between. Um, this literary approach is uh, just one of the many novel ways in which the Book of Mormon is, is being approached. Uh, now, I'm afraid in some ways this presentation might be like drinking uh, water from a, a fire hose. I'm admittedly going for breadth rather than depth here, just to give you a general sense of, of what's going on in the field. There's a lot happening. And to be clear, I'm not here simply to discuss what uh, may be termed orthodox approaches, but rather I want to inform you about all of the different types of approaches that we might expect to see in the future, whether we like them or not, like them or not. Uh, I recently helped organize uh, what we dubbed the Book of Mormon Think Tank at the Maxwell Institute. Um, I don't know if I have my slides here. Uh, at this think tank, we kind of broke the Book of Mormon down into several categories. I know it's, uh, it's hard to see here, but uh, we have the basic categories, the world behind the text, the world of the text, the world in front of the text, and the Book of Mormon and the Academy. Uh, the world behind the text is kind of the traditional uh, approach that we've done, the uh, old world studies, um, the uh, new world Mesoamerican studies, uh, but also part of that is uh, 19th century studies as well now. Uh, the world of the text, that's where um, we're building the, uh, a critical text like Skousen has done. Uh, looking at the Book of Mormon as literature uh, and even as uh, comparative text. The world in front of the text, we're looking at the Book of Mormon as a, um, as a canonical text and as a received text. In other words, how has it been received by members of the church at different eras in our history and as a theological text. And then finally, we had a session on the Book of Mormon and the Academy where we were looking forward um, to um, Book of Mormon in Mormon studies itself. Again, it's primarily dominated by church history rather than... Um, scriptural studies, uh, and then trying to extend that out to the Book of Mormon in the larger field of religious studies. Uh, and then even things like the Book of Mormon and gender, you'd think maybe there wouldn't be much to do with that, but there actually are some, um, some exciting work that has been um, done in those regards. Uh, it was, we, we had a, a wide range of scholars there, um, from those like me who are convinced that it's a historical text to others who weren't so sure and others who just simply didn't care. Um, but the meetings it's, uh, themselves were were characterized by, by civil discourse. We actually uh, uh, enjoyed each other's company despite our, our wide range of opinions. Now I admit that it actually broadened my perspective as to the value of other types of research. Um, 
I've always been kind of a, you know, when you're a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and to me, Mesoamerica is, is my hammer. Um, now, I have no interest in pursuing myself uh, research concerning the Book of Mormon that brackets the historicity, uh, but I do actually recognize the, the value of such approaches. Uh, I want people to get excited about the Book of Mormon, and not everybody gets excited about archaeology. I don't understand why, right? Um, but... Uh, but honestly, I think whatever we can do to get people's noses in the book, it's worth the effort. Uh, if we want them to be touched by the Spirit as they read from the pages, they first have to read from the pages. So let's not discourage anyone from doing research, even if they think they need to bracket the uh, historicity question. Um, so one of these approaches is a, a doctrinal or theological approach. Uh, Robert Millet. Uh, discussed with me that he would like to see more books about the specific doctrine of the Book of Mormon, our unique LDS perspectives on its theology aimed at a, at a non-Mormon audience. He worded it this way, I'm surprised that some enterprising student of the Book of Mormon hasn't prepared a book written for those not of our faith that focuses on the distinctive theology of the book that highlights its teachings on such manner, matters as the oneness of the Godhead, the nature of fallen man, the infinite scope of the atonement, salvation by grace, being born again, the proper care of wealth, the destiny of the house of Israel, divine versus human knowledge, the Bible and the promise of other scriptural records, etc. cetera. Uh, close quote. This book is actually much more theologically complex uh, than maybe we've given it credit for in the past. Uh, Joe Spencer is doing wonderful work uh, in shedding light on that aspect of the book. Uh, if that's not a name you're familiar with, um, you will be soon. Um, he wrote a book called An Other Testament. It's a thin little book, uh, and it takes a lot longer to read than you think. Uh, it is thin, but it is, it is meaty. Uh, and if you really want your mind expanded as to the theological depth uh, of the Book of Mormon, uh, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. It was originally published by Salt Press. It's now being reissued um, through the, uh, the Maxwell Institute. Now, thanks to the uh, tireless work of Royal Skousen over the past couple of decades, we have a critical text of the Book of Mormon. Anyone doing serious research needs to be working from Royal, Royal's texts. Uh, what type of textual work remains to be done then? Uh, structurally, we've barely touched the text. A couple of attempts have been made at creating speaker's editions of the Book of Mormon, uh, which typically use formatting and marginal notations to clearly indicate who is speaking at any given moment throughout the book. And it actually is surprisingly helpful in keeping the story straight when you know exactly who is speaking at any given moment. Uh, hopefully such editions will be made available one day. They're trying to get clearance. Um, but beyond just knowing who the speakers are at any given moment, we need to better identify and delineate the different types of texts that are present in the book. Epistles, proclamations, sermons, edited works, quotations, blessings, etc. Why bother? What's the point? Because a lot can be learned when we compare and contrast these different types of works to see if there's any statistically significant differences between their composition. Um, a uh, paper just came across my desk for review uh, in the past week, uh, comparing, looking at chiasmus. Some critics of the church have uh, suggested that, uh, you know, you can find chiasmus anywhere if you look hard enough. Uh, and so they essentially attributed uh, its appearance in the Book of Mormon by accident. And so this uh, author went through and looked to see if it appears in predictable places. And it turns out we find it uh, in sermons very regularly and predictably but we don't find it in letters or in other types of discourse, and that's significant. It shows that it's not an accidental uh, thing. But again, we need to do a better job of delineating the different types of, um, of uh, texts within the Book of Mormon in order to do these types of analyses. So the structure itself demands more research. Why is there a second Nephi when it's still Nephi writing? We don't have a second Alma. Uh, and for that matter, why, do, why does Alma not end in Alma 44 when Helaman takes over the record in Alma 45. 45 through 62 are written by Helaman. It's almost a third of the book. Um, we, we still have a lot to learn when it comes to the structure itself of the Book of Mormon. Now, when we do a meta-analysis of the Book of Mormon, we need to be careful to distinguish between the small plates, uh, Mormon's record, Moroni's record. Um, the book that we have is not the same book that Mormon wrote. We're missing the first 116 pages. The way he structured it started with the Book of Lehi, uh, and then he ends up adding in the, the small plates. Um, but we have to assume that Mormon 
carefully constructed his book, and unfortunately, due to the lost 116 pages, that structure, uh, some of that structure may have been lost. Go to the next slide here. Uh, if we want the study of the Book of Mormon to be taken seriously by academic standards, uh, we really need to abide by academic um, methodologies. In the religion department, we actually have assembled a, a small group of faculty uh, comprised of some junior faculty and some senior faculty. Uh, we're calling it the Book of Mormon Academy. Uh, and what we're trying to do is jumpstart the study of the Book of Mormon uh, in the religion department. And um, one thing that we uh, did recently was we, uh, we all read a book on biblical exegesis. We had S. Kent Brown come and talk to us a little bit about uh, those approaches. And uh, in discussing these different approaches, uh, it occurred to us that it might be fun as sort of an academic exercise to see if we could apply these different approaches, not just generally to the Book of Mormon, but to take a specific pericope from the Book of Mormon. Um, let's take the Abinadi account, for example. And we, we may or may not uh, follow through on this, but it, it was kind of a fun thought exercise. So textual criticism, that's when you try to find the original wording, and Royal, again, has uh, pretty much done the work on that for us. Um, but what if we were also too subjected to historical criticism? And again, just speaking specifically about the Abinadi narrative, to try to situate it in its original time and place. What could Mesoamerican scholarship add to our understanding of that particular account? Could Mesoamerican beliefs in deity complexes or multiple, multiple manifestations of a single deity help us understand Abinadi's somewhat confusing description of Christ as both father and son, flesh and spirit? Or could it help us understand Abinadi's martyrdom a little bit better in conjunction with Skousen's textual criticism that informs us that Abinadi was scorched to death with faggots rather than being scourged to death since we find ancient images of captives in Mesoamerica being killed by having torches repeatedly pressed against them until they succumb to death. Or perhaps we could attempt a grammatical criticism wherein we analyze Abinadi's semantics or look into his rhetoric using literary criticism or use form criticism to ascertain what genre of literature this fits into within the Book of Mormon. Or tradition criticism, uh, wherein we explore the particular theology espoused by Abinadi and contrast it with that of earlier and later prophets. Are there any differences? Or redaction criticism, how is Mormon's hand evident in shaping this particular narrative to conform to his overarching vision of the text? Or structuralist criticism, wherein we take an atemporal look at universal themes in Abinadi's teachings, how the modern reader connects to the deep structures of the text that transcend specific cultural contexts, the fundamental binary opposition between good and evil, human and divine, and the tension that the person of Christ embodies from a structuralist perspective. He is father and son, he is flesh and spirit, he is human and divine. Uh, and this approach will give us a very different insight than what we talked about with the uh, historical criticism, for example, but perhaps equally interesting. Interesting. And finally, canonical criticism. How do Avinadi's teachings fit into the theology of the Book of Mormon as a whole, or even with the expanded canon that our church enjoys? Uh, now, biblical scholarship can also be used to, uh, as we re-examine biblical passages within the Book of Mormon. Uh, for example, what light can current Isaiah scholarship uh, give us on the, uh, the shared Isaiah chapters? David Bakavoy is currently putting the finishing touches on a book about the uh, documentary hypothesis in relation to, the, uh, to Genesis through Deuteronomy. And this, of course, will have uh, relevance to the Book of Mormon as a whole, but, and even to our understanding of the brass plates. Uh, along those lines, more work needs to be done in examining intertextuality between the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Biblical passages are woven throughout the Book of Mormon from start to finish, beyond just the obvious Isaiah sections, and they do demand closer scrutiny. Some work has been done in identifying which passages are directly quoted, or at least alluded to, but to be honest, not enough has been done in answering why they are there, especially when it comes to New, pa New Testament passages that crop up prior to the visit of Christ. We shouldn't, shy, we shouldn't shy away from such questions, by the way. We need to tackle them head on, and we need qualified scholars to do it. Fina fascinating work is being done examining intertextuality within the Book of Mormon itself. In other words, when later prophets hearken back to the words of earlier prophets, either explicitly or implicitly. John Hilton III uh, from BYU is doing exciting work using a word cruncher technology that is finding previously undetected examples where prophets in the Book of Mormon either directly quote or make subtle allusions to the teachings of earlier prophets. Uh, for example, when Alma is preaching to the people of Ammonihah, he uh, hearkens unto King Benjamin's words, King Benjamin's words, 
but when he counsels his son Coriantum, he emphasizes the words of Abinadi. Now, another scholar, a number of scholars I spoke to highlighted the need to create a more sophisticated chronology uh, and a detailed historical geography of the Book of Mormon. Uh, for example, um, uh, Bill Hamblin uh, emphasized that we need to carefully study when toponyms appear, when they disappear, their geographical relationships to each other, uh, and at different times uh, and in different places. Uh, Kirk Magleby has actually done some work in this regard. Uh, Dr. Hamblin would also like to see more research that brings together the chronologies of the ancient Near East, the Book of Mormon, and Mesoamerica in a way that makes them all fit together logically. Uh, Brant Gardner, Carrie Hole, and I, Mesoamerican us all, we all agree that closer attention to chronology will also allow us to trace the acculturation of the, uh, the Nephites into their new world environment. We frankly don't expect to see much Mesoamerican influence in the writings of Nephi or Jacob, for example. But by the time we get to Omni, I think we, it really begins to show through. But I haven't studied it systematically, neither has anyone else. But it needs to be done. Another exciting project is the, uh, the Book of Mormon Onomasticon, the study of names. The Maxwell Institute recently launched uh, a website uh, with an online onomasticon. It's a complete database of names from the Book of Mormon with suggested etymologies for each. The names can be sorted alphabetically and in reverse alphabetical order, which is useful when analyzing suffixes. Uh, they have a chart which breaks down which plates each of the names comes from, from the brass plates, small plates, plates of Mormon, etc. It notes which names are Nephite, which are Lamanite, Mulekite, Jaredite, etc. Uh, now this is useful. For example, it seems that names that start with core, like K-O-R or C-O-R, are Jaredite derivatives that work their way into Mulekites and then later into Nephites, uh, naming pra practices. So there is still so much to be done with the onomastics, uh, and this database is a phenomenal resource, just waiting to be mined. Now, of course, the, uh, the approach to the Book of Mormon that is nearest and dearest to my heart is obviously Mesoamerican uh, archaeology. That's what gets me excited. Uh, and I know this crowd, and that's what, get most, gets, that's what gets most of you excited. Uh, we read it, and to us, it is so obvious that Mesoamerica is the right place. It's just dripping with Mesoamerican culture. Um, and even though we've been at it for 50 or 60 years, there is just still so much yet to be done. Now, one of the limitations of Book of Mormon archaeology is simply the paucity of available data. Let me go to my next slide here. This is uh, George Stewart. He was uh, National Geographic's uh, resident Mayanist for the, uh, basically the latter half of the 20th century. His son is David Stewart, the world's leading Mayan epigrapher. Um, just uh, earlier this year, uh, he was uh, interviewed, and he said, truth is, we don't know squat. There's about 6,000 known Maya sites, and we've only researched about 5% of them. Now, I actually was talking to George just a few months before he did this interview. Um, in, uh, I was in North Carolina at a conference, and um, I asked him, I said, that, George, you know, we'd just seen a presentation with new satellite imagery that revealed kind of these 6,000 sites. And I said, George, how much of this have we excavated? And he held up one finger, and he said, and that's why we don't know. And he didn't say squat, but he did say something that started with an S. Uh, <laughs> he's not a Latter-day Saint, obviously. Um, now, let's, let's say the number is somewhere between 1% and 5%. That means we've excavated, or uh, not even excavated, but at least researched anywhere from between 60 at the low end to 300 at the high end of uh, Mayan sites. So that means there are between 5,700 and 5,940 sites out of 6,000 that we haven't studied. And that's why we don't know squat. <laughs> Uh, now, to be fair, more and more sites are being excavated and the, re the reports are being published. But we're still only talking about a dozen or two sites, not hundreds and certainly not thousands. But with each of these reports comes new information, which allows us to make stronger arguments, especially when it comes to pre-classic period sites. As many of you know, I'm not a huge fan of specific re uh, geography when it comes to the Book of Mormon. I don't care if it's the Grijalva or the Usumacinta. It just, I don't know, it doesn't matter to me. Um, but I think that as we get more and more survey and excavation reports, we might be able to home in on Zarahemla. Uh, Kerry Hull, uh, a very well-respected Mayanist who just recently joined the Ancient Scripture faculty at BYU in the last couple of months, uh, he commented to me that more research needs to be done in determining ancient geographical landscapes in Mesoamerica, with a special focus on hydrology. This is something that hadn't really occurred to me. He noted that core samples from the Veracruz region indicate that anciently it used to be far more swampy and the lake covered a much greater area, and there were more of them, which of course has implications for discussions concerning the narrow neck and perhaps even the meaning of seas. Uh, it, 
essentially between the mountain and the sea, if the swamp is, you know, 20 miles uh, instead of a few miles, uh, it makes the pass much narrower, so to speak. Uh, now, I'll note also that the lowland region of Guatemala, known as Paten, one of these areas that had more water in it than currently does now, um, the word Paten is the Maya word for island. It's an ancient word, uh, and that word, um, the designation Paten or island, has been used since at least the classic period. And that perhaps adds ex extra, extra significance to Jacob's words in 2 Nephi 10.20 that says, we are upon an isle of the sea. Now, uh, I mentioned there are those who think we should bracket the question of historicity in our study of the Book of Mormon, whereas others see it, that as a fatal mistake. My personal stance is that those who feel they need to bracket the historicity in their own research should feel free to do so, but they should respect that academic approaches to the historicity question are valid and worth pursuing. Placing the events of the Book of Mormon in the historical context adds richness and depth to our understanding of the book. Those who feel we must focus exclusively on its 19th century origin, regardless of whether or not they deem it true, and completely ignore the ancient uh, origins are simply myopic. No legitimate big biblical scholar would ever suggest ignoring the historical context of the Bible. The Book of Mormon is an ancient book, and we, we cannot abandon that aspect of our study of it. Now, from what I've seen, over the past couple of decades, a good number of the younger generation of ancient Near Eastern specialists uh, we have in the church is because of the fact that they went to the Jerusalem Center, they got really excited about it, and they said, I want to dedicate my life to this. We don't have any equivalent for Book of Mormon research. Now, this is perhaps a pipe dream, but I would love to see at some point in the future, maybe this is 20 or 30 or 100 years away, uh, a Book of Mormon Center for Mesoamerican research, maybe uh, housed in Antigua, Guatemala, just because I like that city. Uh, this next uh, section is, um, well, hopefully it doesn't come across as, as being harsh. Uh, but as many of you are aware, uh, I was recently uh, named an associate editor of the, the Journal Book of Mormon Studies at the Maxwell Institute. We're going to take it back to its original name. For the past few years, it's been called the Journal of the Book of Mormon and Other Restoration Scriptures, which we abbreviate to J.B. S'mores. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we want to return the focus to uh, the Book of Mormon. Um, the editorial board is Brian Hoglid as the uh, editor, and then Joe Spencer and I as the, uh, the associate editors. Um, I want to assure you that uh, the, the journal is not abandoning its, um, its uh, ancient approach, uh, but rather it is adding in other approaches uh, as well. Um, but I, I will not allow them to take away the historicity uh, thing. Because uh, that's, you know, that's my bread and butter. That's what I love. Um, but I'm also, uh, aside from being an associate editor of the um, Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, uh, I'm also very proud that I'm a, a contributing editor and a founding member of the Interpreter Journal. And I'm also a member of the Board of Directors here at the Book of Mormon Archaeological Forum. And due to those commitments, I, I have a fairly steady stream of papers that come across my desk um, for review, uh, for publication in, in one venue or another. And some of these articles are absolutely thrilling and a joy to read, the one I just mentioned concerning a chiasmus appearing in, in sermons but not in letters. It's exciting stuff. Um, the data is good, the methodology is sound, and they lead naturally to reasonable conclusions. But far too many, however, are just terrible. I don't know how else to word it. Um, they make really honestly preposterous claims based on decontextualized data and wild reinterpretations of well-known, understood archaeological materials. Uh, and I've got to be honest, we do ourselves a disservice when we make wild claims. Uh, we will never be taken seriously by academia if we refuse to abide by academic standards. Now, along those lines, uh, one of the more controversial topics concerning the future of Book of Mormon research is the role of apologetics, whether or not it should be even be done at all, and how to do it. Now, for any who may be unfamiliar with the term, apologetics simply means a scholarly defense of the faith, and so for us, it's a scholarly defense of the Book of Mormon. Um, my hope is that we can find a balance wherein we can defend the Book of Mormon without being defensive. Um, I'm a Star Wars geek. This next slide, uh, I think, represents what we sometimes do. Uh, we've got little Anakin there saying, if you're not with me, then you're my enemy. And then Obi-Wan says, only a Sith deals in absolutes. Uh, now, Obi-Wan is there speaking in an absolute, so I'm not sure what that says about him. Um, <laughs> But uh, I worry when we, when we label each other, you know, good guys, uh, bad guys. 
Um, and I can't help but wonder if the church, if we as a church, suffer from kind of a, a deep-seated persecution complex uh, that leads us to assume that anytime someone raises a question about the Book of Mormon, that they must be seen as uh, an anti-Mormon trying to attack us. Now, whether we like it or not, the study of Book of Mormon now falls under the umbrella of the emerging field of Mormon studies, and more and more questions are going to be coming in the future. So we need to be part of the scholarly conversation uh, without turning it into a shouting match. Uh, one of my colleagues in religious education, uh, a well-respected scholar in his field, expressed concern that our attempt to quote-unquote prove the Book of Mormon actually demonstrates a profound insecurity about ourselves. We don't see Buddhists attempting to prove their sacred writings, and I don't think you'd ever hear a um, an Islamic scholar marvel, how could Muhammad have known? Okay. Uh, but let's not be afraid to acknowledge the plausibility of alternative explanations, even those that may be completely contrary to our own. If it's a sound argument, let's acknowledge it and attempt to address it fully and not turn it into a straw man. Brian Hoglid, the new director of the Willis Center and the newly appointed editor of the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, mentioned to me that we should strive to be a little more open and honest about both the pros and the cons. Ignoring dis difficult issues does not make them go away but addressing the tough questions, but when addressing the tough questions, let's make sure that we're not presenting our theories as facts. Uh, I'll admit I get nervous anytime I uh, review an article wherein someone claims to have proven anything. I found that typically those that proclaim most boldly to have proof of something are those that present the weakest evidence and arguments uh, and using a impossibly strong language. In mainstream archaeology, we use lots of qualifying words such as maybe, perhaps, possibly. Uh, you won't find many archaeologists who claim to have proven anything. We'll return to that later uh, and what we know and don't know in archaeology. Several years ago, I had something of an epiphany regarding my own approach to apologetics. I realized that I'm not out to prove the Book of Mormon true, but I am out to prove it interesting. Along those lines, uh, LDS philosopher Jim Faulkner suggested that richness is the new proof. I believe we can paint a vivid picture of the history historicity of the Book of Mormon based on the wealth of information and confirming evidence that we already have, and we will continue to add to it as new evidence comes forth. I'm often asked what I think is the single most impressive piece of evidence for the Book of Mormon, but for me it really isn't a single piece of evidence, but rather it's the way the thousands of little puzzle pieces all fit together so perfectly to form a perfect picture. Now continuing with that analogy, sometimes we discover that we've put a piece of the puzzle in uh, that's the wrong piece or it's in the wrong place. One of the most important things we can do to further the work of Book of Mormon studies is to acknowledge the mistakes of the past and to do our best to correct and move beyond them. It's okay to admit when we were wrong. Sometimes more recent scholarship will invalidate some of our previous arguments. That's just how science works. And it certainly doesn't disprove the Book of Mormon. Even Moroni asked that we cut the Book of Mormon a little slack on the title page when he said that if there are mistakes, they are the faults of men. Um, Royal Skousen has found thousands upon thousands of flaws or changes or mistakes or whatever you want to call them. Um, but we'll hear shortly that those supposed flaws have only deepened his testimony of the Book of Mormon and the Prophet Joseph Smith. Hugh Nibley is a wonderful model of scholarly humility. Had this to say, I refuse to be held uh, responsible for anything I wrote more than three years ago. For heaven's sake, I hope we're moving forward here. After all the implication that one mistake and it's all over with, how flattering to think in 40 years I have not made one slip and I'm still in business. I would say about four-fifths of everything I put down has changed, of course. That's the whole idea. This is an ongoing process. And I have some interesting examples of that, he says. So let me give you a specific example of something um, that we were wrong about in the past, that we should acknowledge and then just let go of it. And frankly, never ever try to use again as evidence for the Book of Mormon. I've entitled this, Kish This One Goodbye. This is the so-called Kish Glyph. As the argument goes, this glyph here appears uh, on, at, at uh, Palenque. And um, essentially the argument is that uh, it refers to an Olmec ruler in the distant past named Kish. Uh, and since the Olmec date to the time period of Jaredites, there was a Jaredite king named Kish. So then, therefore, the Palenque, uh, the king mentioned in the text of Palenque is therefore the, the Jaredite king. But the problem is this glyph is not read Kish. Um, the glyph itself, is a representation of a stingray spine, a very common element in Maya iconography due to their use as bloodletting implements. Thanks to adva advances in Maya epigraphy, we now know that the most likely reading of the stingray glyph is Kokan, not Kish. So where did the erroneous Kish reading come from? Back in 1976, when the decipherment of Maya glyphs was still in its infancy, Linda Sheely tentatively proposed the phonetic reading of Kish for this glyph, 
because that's the word for stingray spine in some modern Mayan languages. But it was always clear to epigraphers that Kish was intended to be more of a nickname, since there were no phonetic complements that supported that reading. Uh, usually when, a ruler's name would, when that ruler's name would appear in the scholarly literature, it would be found with quotation marks around it, which is uh, shorthand among epigraphers that denotes a, a nickname rather than a phonetic reading. We've come up with some crazy nicknames in the past. There's a ruler named Ekopan uh, Washaklehunu Bach Kawil, which means 18 are the images of Kawil. Uh, but his nickname was 18 Rabbit. Right? Before we knew how to read it, we called him 18 Rabbit. Now we know his name is Washaklehunu Bach Kawil. Very different reading, right? Um, so, unfortunately, uh, Bruce Warren uh, came across this uh, phonetic reading, saw Kish. Um, the proposed reading of Kish for this uh, mythological ruler, uh, and he, he published and said that this might be a, a reference to uh, this ruler in the, uh, the Book of Mormon. Now, this is not in any way an attempt to diminish the legacy of, of Dr. Warren. He just passed away a, a few months ago, and he's one of our former recipients of the Father Lehi Award here at the BMAF, and we honor his legacy. Uh, but likewise, a great deal of Linda Sheely's work, upon which Bruce Warren based his arguments, is completely outdated at this point. And she showed the same scholarly humility as Nibley did. She wanted people to prove her wrong. She wanted the field to move forward. Uh, and I can't think of a single reading that Linda Sheely proposed that is still accepted basically, you know, letter by letter or glottal by glottal. Uh, every single one of them has, has advanced beyond that. Um, so the point is, we need to constantly update our arguments based on the best data available. Uh, the reason this is so critical is because when we base our arguments on bad data and or bad methods, which are easily disproven to the outsider, it makes it seem like the Book of Mormon itself has been disproven. In other words, if our proof that the Book of Mormon is true is the Kishcliffe, and then it turns out that the Kishcliffe isn't really the Kishcliffe, then unbelievers think that that proves the Book of Mormon false. Uh, but the problem isn't the book, the problem is the arguments that we make. Now this is not in any way to suggest that all work on the Book of Mormon is somehow outdated. Dan mentioned that his, uh, he had to change his topic. That was partly my fault, and I want to apologize to him again for that. Um, but um, his original title was going to be On the Shoulders of Giants, and he was going to talk about the legacy of farms. Uh, and by and large, the, the material produced by farms uh, stands the test of time. I mean, it is phenomenal work. Uh, it's the reason I'm here today. And not only farms, but uh, BYU Studies, things produced by the Religious Studies Center at BYU, uh, as, as well as other venues. Again, they've just stood the test of time well. Uh, but as uh, Joe Spencer noted, we need to take serious stock of what's been done so that we don't just reinvent the wheel and so that we can learn to appreciate more deeply all that has been done. To be honest, I can't count the number of times I've come up with what I think is some brilliant new insight about Mesoamerica and the Book of Mormon, only, dig in, only to dig into the literature and discover that John Sorensen or Brant Gardner had somehow managed to publish my new idea years before I ever thought of it. Now, Kerry Hole, who I mentioned earlier, uh, thought it was very important that I uh, stress the limitations of archaeology and historical research, and I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, there's a misperception out there that archaeology is a fairly precise science, uh, but I'm afraid that's not as true as we like. Here I want to quote the words of the venerable Indiana Jones. He says, uh, archaeology is the search for fact, not truth. If it's truth you're looking for, Dr. Tyree's philosophy class is right down the hall. Now you can't see it, but down there I, I have uh, Dr. Henry Indiana Jones, professor of archaeology, Marshall College, and then in parentheses I have fictional, but he's real to me. Uh, he and John Sorensen really are the re reason that I'm, I'm here today. Um, but this is overstated. Uh, when we talk about fact, there's a difference between real facts and archaeological facts. Uh, Dr. Hull gives the following example. If gold is found next to an individual in a burial, it could be an archaeological fact that gold existed in that society. Or maybe not. Maybe it was just traded up from another area. Does it signify the person who was wealthy? Or were they a thief? Or could it be that later generations added that into the tomb for some reason? Who's to say? Well, the archaeologist, using deductive reasoning based on all the quote-unquote facts before them, and this is where the subjective side of archaeology comes in, into play. The filling in process of interpretation is often what gets the headlines. In other words, quote, this cup found in this elite burial was used for rain bringing ceremonies by this ritual priest. There's a joke in archaeology. If you dig something up, you don't know what it is, you say, this is a ritual object, right? 
I actually had a little bit of a crisis of archaeological faith years ago. Uh, I was uh, new in graduate school, uh, and um, I decided to take a little trip over to Catalina, and I'm sitting on the beach, and this little kid starts grabbing these big stones. Uh, they're about yay big, and he puts them in to a perfect, not even a perfect circle, to a nice little oval. Uh, they were all uniform in their size and shape, um, and uh, he used 13 of them. And then he got bored and he ran away. And I just stared at it. I'm like, dude, if I dug that up, right, I would, have, I would infer so much meaning. For the Maya, um, the, um, you know, the, the, the back of a turtle, uh, or the earth itself was the back of a turtle. And the turtle carapace actually has 13, um, I don't remember the word uh, offhand, but there's 13 sections of a turtle shell. And so the number 13 is very significant to the Maya. The fact that this was near the seashore, obviously a representation of the primordial earth rising from the waters, right? And I realized this is all a sham, right? We just make everything up. Um, and so I went into my, my professor that, that next weekend and uh, Wendy Ashmore, and she kind of talked me down a little bit. She's like, you know, that's why we look for things like carbon scoring, you know, were they doing any kind of offerings or anything like that? And I said, yeah, but seriously, if you dug that up, and she was like, yeah, I would have made something of it. <laughs> um, and that's what we do. And it's is interesting, too, to see the way that our theories of the Maya collapse, specifically, uh, follow social trends. We still don't know why the Maya collapsed, by the way. Uh, in the, the early, in the, in the 70s, when there was sort of the backlash against Vietnam, the, the Maya had collapsed because of, uh, because of war. Uh, in the 90s, when Earth Day became popular, it was, no, it was because they, they overforested, or they, they deforested their, their landscape, uh, and that led to, uh, to famine, uh, and, and on and on. We can actually f map uh, social changes in American uh, thought onto explanations of Maya collapse. It's really quite a fascinating study in and of itself. Um, in uh, one of our leading scholarly journals in archaeology, um, a non-LDS archaeologist named uh, Mark Plusinik, um wrote the following, and again I want to thank Kerry Hull for bringing my attention to this particular quote. Uh, Plusinik says, all archaeologists routinely use law-like causal explanation to explain outcomes related to the invariable properties of certain types of materials and processes, such as the taphonomy of a site, and may invoke broad ecological principles, for example, as well as using more contentious explanations, in quotes. Um, generalizations, analogies, and speculations derived from social theory, ethnography, ecology, or biology. So that's a fancy way of saying what I just said. It is the general, at the general level of appropriateness of approach and attribution of possible meaning, the nature of plot and the type of narrative object constructed, the paradigmatic archaeological debates take place. Uh, Plusinik also mentioned that, quote, archaeology, like any other narrative objects or post hoc constructions. In other words, we're imposing meaning on these objects that we dig up. And while they are and have been the dominant form in which the past is represented, I'm sorry, presented, yet for historical philosophies, reasons there, uh, for historical philo philosophical reasons, there, have been a, there has been a tendency to analyze them only insofar as they can be treated as a form of explanation or knowledge analogous to that science. In other words, it's kind of the circular thing where we have this preconceived notion, we dig something up, and if it conforms to that, great. If not, we reimagine what it was for so it does conform. Simply put, there are actually a lot of debates in archaeology. If we were dealing with facts, there would be no debates. Yet there's a lot we don't know. We don't know squat, as George Stewart says, right? Um, now, on to a different subject. Uh, when I asked my fellow Book of Mormon scholars what they hope to see in the future with regards to Book of Mormon research, virtually all of them stated that they would like to see more comprehensive reference materials, both in print and in electronic formats. Most of our commentaries tend to focus on uh, doctrinal issues or kind of another subset, uh, but there needs to be more comprehensive academic uh, encyclopedic reference works. Brant Gardner's six-volume commentary was a very ambitious attempt, and I recommend everyone buy a complete set, by the way. I don't get any royalties from that, but I think it's fantastic. But what we really need uh, is more along the lines of a 20-volume set <clears throat> created by a wide range of Book of Mormon scholars that each bring their specific areas of expertise to the table. It should include everything from theology to etymology to archaeology, etc., not just sprinkled with some of the extra juicy bits from each of these, but consistent chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and in some case, word by word uh, analyses. 
I can tell you that there is uh, legitimate interest in creating such a comprehensive commentary, and some preliminary discussions have taken place uh, about doing that, uh, but only time will tell if that project, uh, in fact, moves forward. High quality reference materials will be critical to the future, future of Book of Mormon research. My hope is that it can help break us out of what I call the echo chamber, wherein most of us, most of what is written about the Book of Mormon is by Mormon scholars and geared towards a Mormon audience. Uh, we've had a couple of our finest Latter-day Saint scholars break through the barrier, most notably Terrell Givens by the Hand of Mormon and Grant Hardy's Understanding of the Book of Mormon, uh, both of which were published by Oxford University Press. Uh, as an aside, uh, academic presses are, are quite interested in books on Mormonism right now. Uh, primarily, not that they care about Mormonism, but they care about their bottom line. A typical academic book sells 1,000 to 2,000 copies, uh, and a typical um, LDS book uh, is selling about 10,000 copies. Uh, this was just in the news in the last week. It was so noteworthy that, that uh, it was reported about. Um, so the, the opportunity is there uh, for publication, and, and we may be in the midst of another uh, golden age. Um, I consider the uh, kind of the, the farms era uh, to be a, a golden age. I mean, the, the, just the finest scholarship in the church um, was produced during that time. Now, as mentioned earlier, Mormon studies as a field uh, as a field is beginning to make some inroads in the larger religious studies community. But we need to do more to actually integrate the Book of Mormon into the larger field of Mormon studies and then work it into the field of uh, religious studies. Some inroads are being made by simply approaching it as 19th century literature, which many faithful members may balk at. Uh, but it is the first step in elevating the profile of the Book of Mormon in academia, regardless of its historicity. It is a piece of religious literature, and it should be put in conversation with other religious literature, like the, the Gita, the Quran, etc. But we need to step up our game in order to incorporate the Book of Mormon into the realm of world scripture. We need to learn how to, we need to, learn how to present its theology in a way that does not sound like a gospel principles manual. Now, there are many aspects of Book of Mormon research uh, that are currently being explored that I simply don't have time to address. Things like the reception history. In other words, how is the Book of Mormon being used to shape the identi identity of the church as a whole? How has it affected the, uh, the identification of groups traditionally labeled as Lamanites? How has it affected the way that whites have conceptualized or treated such, treated such groups? We haven't discussed gender approaches in the Book of Mormon but there is actually a great deal of potential there as well. Now to conclude, I think the future of Book of Mormon studies is very bright. There are exciting things happening and there is much more yet to be done. Just at BYU and the Maxwell Institute, as I mentioned, we've got a new editorial board at the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. We've got the formation of the Book of Mormon Academy among faculty members in religious education. Um, the Religious Studies Center is expressing renewed interest in scholarly approaches to the Book of Mormon. Uh, outside of the campus bubble, or the compound as I call it, um, we have this new, uh, we have the new interpreter journal, which has regularly been publishing first-rate articles about the Book of Mormon. And we here at uh, the BMAF are looking for ways, uh, looking toward the future, in making our efforts both more scholarly and more readily available. My hope is that the younger generation will pursue Book of Mormon research from a variety of angles. It is a multifaceted book, and we need, to, we need those who specialize in a broad range of fields from more traditional approaches that we have been doing like archaeology, anthropology, history, art history, linguistics, epigraphy, iconography, but also less obvious approaches like ethnobotany, literary specialists, geography, economics. Uh, just last week I was able to speak to the chaplain seminar, uh, all of the military chaplains in the church up at the church office building, and I had uh, one of the chaplains say, has anybody done like a, a really nice you know, military study of the Book of Mormon? Uh, and I referred him to some works done by farms, of course. Uh, but we also need people studying theology and philosophy and science and rhetoric, etc. There are a lot of different ways to, uh, to study this book. Uh, and I don't think this is just a pipe dream. Uh, seeing the uh, current crop of uh, scholars and the younger generation, um, I think we actually are at the cusp of a, a, a renaissance in Book of Mormon research. Uh, and I'm very anxious to see what the future will bring. Uh, Joe Spencer, my, I'm going to go to another slide here. You can Joe Spencer, who I've uh, mentioned a, a few times before, my co-associate editor at the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, he shared his hope for the future of Book of Mormon Studies. He said, we need then to do all we can to get a wide range, a wider range of academics working on the Book of Mormon, at the very least so that we can begin to see how much more is at work in the text than that we've tended to see. Grateful for, for all that has been done, it's time to widen the scope of what can be done so that we have a broader vision of what this text accomplishes. Uh, for me, I'd like to think 
of Book of Mormon studies actually as being prismatic, meaning the light is divided but not necessarily diminished. Just like the distinctive rays of color are inherently part of the unity of all colors, my hope is that one day the field of Book of Mormon studies will come to represent the unity of all of these beautiful rays of light being produced by different academic approaches. Thank you. I tried to run out the clock like Dan recommended, so I don't have time. Do I have time for questions? Do you want to take one? Go ahead and take one question. I'll take one very easy question. Kirk. Kerry Hole is, is uh, brilliant. Um, I've actually known him for years. I knew him in the, um, uh, just from archaeological conferences. He's a, he's a linguist, a Mayanist. He's a polyglot. He knows 15 languages. Uh, not just sort of studied a little bit on his own. I mean, he's actually taught these at a university level. Um, he uh, has been teaching in Japan for the past several years. Um, but um, the first time I ever did field work, actually, I hadn't even met the guy. I had a friend of a friend that says, oh, yeah, he knows some people down in the Chorty area and kind of the, the border of Guatemala. I contacted him out of the blue. I'm like, you don't know me. I'm interested in studying the Chorty. He set everything up for me. He just said, show up at this hotel at this date, at this time, and everything will be ready for you. Um, and it took about three or four years before somebody else pointed out to me, they're like, hey, do you know Carrie's Mormon? I'm like, you're kidding me. And, <laughs> and so essentially what Carrie had done, there is still a lot of um, academic bias against Mormons. Um, they, you know, we might as well be studying UFOs or Bigfoot, to be honest. Um, and he wanted to sort of prove himself academically so he could be taken seriously in the field. Um, but um, last year, we were down in Antigua in a conference together, uh, and I just I said, Carrie, have you ever thought about teaching in ancient scripture department? And he's like, no, I've applied over in anthropology before, but uh, you know, I've never really considered religious education. Um, and then a few months later, he emailed me, and he's like, you know, I've been fasting and praying and thinking about this, um, and I think I'm going to apply. Um, and so he did, but uh, he, he has works, I mean, his CV is a mile long. He's got just publications in every, all of our top journals. He's got uh, books co-published with uh, the, best, the best scholars in the field. His PhD is from uh, UT Austin, graduated in 2004. His main focus was, um, or his dissertation was called, um, oh, I don't remember the name of it, but it's, it's about poetic discourse. Um, among the modern Chorty and then reading that back into uh, classic Maya text. So he basically has found chiasmus, parallelism, etc. in the ancient Maya texts, um, which our conference last year in Antigua was dedicated to that entire subject, uh, which, is just, which is fascinating. So very well respected in the field. I'm curious to see what him coming to religious education is going to do to his reputation in the field, just because, I mean, he's established a good reputation, but the bias is so strong, I'm really anxious to see what's going to happen. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you.